Good morning, it's nearly 9.20am here in Seoul. I'm also on bringing you a live international symposium on building peace on the Korean Peninsula, taking place here in South Korea. The annual event is set to begin in just moments, organised by South Korea's Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism, along with the Yonsei Institute for North Korean Studies. The symposium comes at a momentous time as the change of office in the United States to the Joe Biden presidency is set to shift the course of international relations. And thus, this uh, session begins with our very own uh, chief anchor, Moon Gon Young, who is an award-winning journalist and documentary maker here in Arirang TV. And she will be leading the session and will go straight to the scenes. As well as a new incoming administration, in Washington with uh, President-elect Joe Biden set to take office in, on January 20th, 2021. As one of the most consequential uh, bilateral cooperations or relationships in the Asia Pacific region, South Korea U.S. cooperation will be crucial to the shaping of the future regional order. So how can South Korea and the United States more effectively coordinate um, on North Korea? And what about for China? Um, what's the impact of the U.S.-China strategic competitions on various policy domains? Uh, what's the agenda for South Korea-U.S. bilateral cooperation in ensuring a stable and inclusive regional order? Kicking off the International Symposium on the uh, Sustainable Peace on the Korean Peninsula. This is Roundtable on Sustainable Peace, the uh, 2020 U.S. presidential elections and its impact on the Korean Peninsula. Um, for the next hour, we'll discuss uh, these questions and more with this wonderful panel of, um, group of panelists I have here with me. Of course, right next to me here, I have Professor Moon jung in Professor Emeritus of Yonsei University. Professor Moon, of course, currently also serves as the special advisor to the South Korean president for foreign affairs and national security. Professor Moon, good to have you here with us. And of course, um, joining us online, we have Robert Gallucci, Distinguished Professor of Georgetown University. Ambassador Gallucci has also served as the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs from 1992 through 94, and as U.S. Ambassador at Large and uh, Special Envoy for the state from 94 to 96. He was the chief U.S. negotiator during the North Korean nuclear crisis um, of 94. Ambassador Gallucci, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, last but not least, we have Harry Kazianis, Senior Director of Korean Studies at the Center for the National Interest. Harry was a member of the Foreign Policy Advisor uh, team of Senator Ted Cruz and Editor-in-Chief uh, of The Diplomat. Harry Kazianis, wonderful to have you on the panel. Thank you. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Now, the pandemic and the related um, economic uh, collapse means that Biden's priorities would be more domestic focused. But by naming Obama administration's veterans like Tony Blinken as Secretary of State and Jake Sullivan as um, National Security Advisor, it seems to, uh, to us that President like Biden is showing uh, that he'll return to the kind of global diplomacy that, um, that Obama I suppose, practiced. Uh, let me begin with you, uh, Professor Moon. How is South Korea gearing up to work with uh, the incoming Biden administration? I believe that the South Korean government will pay great attention to you know, strengthening ROK-US alliance. Therefore, alliance will be the, the first item which President Moon Jae-in will be paying attention to. Another issue is how to deal with the North Korean nuclear issue. And uh, we are, you know, despite you know, some criticism, I think the Trump administration made some progress, but, uh, uh, but Trump administration could not make a really fundamental breakthrough to the North Korean nuclear stalemate. Therefore, President Moon will be working very hard with President-elect Biden to resolve 
North Korea nuclear issue, you know, how to come up with a peaceful resolution of North Korea nuclear issue. Third issue will be, you know, U.S.-China relations. We don't want the U.S. and China uh, to enter new Cold War, you know, because that will be a kind of nightmare for us. And therefore, uh, President Moon will be, you know, discussing with, you know, Biden administration on how to deal with this uh, Chinese rise in a peaceful manner. And finally, uh, there is a lot of common agenda between um, you know, President-elect Biden and President Moon Jae-in. Climate change, we has 100% agreement with uh, President-elect Biden. And the pandemic, uh, President Moon Jae-in proposed no C-station, uh, you know, quarantine and public health cooperative initiative. Uh, therefore, you know, there, had, there should be a lot of things to discuss between the two leaders. And also, you know, weapons of mass dest destruction issue. Of course, our primary concern is how to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. But in that context, the President-elect Biden and President Moon Jae-in have a lot to discuss about, uh, you know, issues pertaining to weapons of mass destruction. And if we have a much lower agenda, there is 100%, you know, uh, congruity between the Biden administration and Moon Jae-in Moon Jae government. Therefore, I think that those are the things that our government will be paying attention. Now, um, Ambassador Gallucci, um, and before I uh, proceed any further, if you, any of you guys have any, um, any views or thoughts, please feel free to jump in any time. But Ambassador Gallucci, how do you expect the South Korea-US alliance to be defined under the Biden administration? I mean, what will the Biden administration view as key components of the South Korea-US alliance? I think to start with uh, the tone of the Biden administration uh, will be more familiar to people in Seoul than the tone of the Trump administration was. In other words, I think the value that the United States place, places traditionally is placed on its in key allies, uh, like the Republic of Korea, like Japan, like NATO. Uh, these fundamental relations uh, with allies that are critical to U.S. security and to international security seem to many of us uh, to take us a back seat to other concerns that President uh, Trump had uh, going to the, particularly the burden sharing and the costs involved in U.S. deployments and in, in the alliance. I think in other words, you're going to see a return to uh, a U.S. approach to its allies, which places from at least my perspective, a proper value uh, on the alliance uh, and recognizes that the alliance is not a gift that we give to another country, but something that is deeply and profoundly in our national security interest, as we think it is in the case of the alliance with the Republic of Korea in your national security interest. So that's the first framing point I, I would make about this. I think um, that means that issues like the burden sharing issue and, and maybe um, operational control, maybe some of the other uh, more tactical issues in the alliance uh, will be addressed uh, in a way that maybe Seoul is more familiar with based upon uh, past American administrations. All that said, uh, I don't think uh, uh, U.S. foreign policy uh, uh, is congruent with anybody else's foreign policy. Uh, we like to think that uh, we are on the same page, we and the South Koreans, uh, but we are going to emphasize different things. I mean, as I think you well know, uh, uh, the denuclearization of the DPRK is, is of, of vital importance to the United States, and we're going to be putting that up front, I'm fairly certain. That doesn't mean that we will be unconcerned about human rights. It doesn't mean we will be unconcerned uh, about other issues uh, as we deal with the North. For example, the prospect for um, uh, relations, economic and political relations between the South and the North, so that uh, a rapprochement uh, between North and South becomes more plausible in the years ahead. I think we'll be concerned about that too. But we're going to be looking, I would 
expect, I would expect the United States to continue to be looking for ways of addressing North Korean concerns about normalization with our concerns about denuclearization. Uh, neither of those words are precise, uh, but what they generally mean uh, is I think that the United States is prepared to move to a normal relationship with the DPRK, provided the North Koreans move over time to a position of a non-nuclear weapon state. Right. Um, now, um, Harry, I want to go over to you. Biden's advisors uh, appear to be keen to reinforce deterrence in the Asia Pacific and restore the credibility U.S. pledges to defend against uh, North Korea's ongoing nuclear development. But President Moon's policy centers on peace rather than deterrence. How do you see this uh, working out? Well, Jennifer, I, I think there's always been a, a natural tension when they're talking about either the Trump administration or the incoming Biden administration on goals, on what our goals are when it comes to North Korea. And I think this is going to become more pronounced when we move into a Biden administration. And, and you know, it's kind of interesting. When we talk about North Korea, when we talk about denuclearization, I, I think it's very clear that in the short to medium term, North Korea is not going to give up its nuclear weapons. I know that's an inconvenient fact in Washington here. A lot of my colleagues on the conservative side do not want to admit that fact, but I'm willing to admit it. We have tried for 30 years now, roughly, to try to get the North Koreans to give up their nuclear weapons in, in some way, shape, or form. They haven't done it. And, and we've tried a lot of different ways. We have tried pressure. We've tried maximum pressure. We've now tried three different summits with Kim Jong-un. We, we have made a lot of, I think, very credible attempts to try and make this dream get realized. It hasn't happened. So what I think that the United States need to do, along with the President Moon, which is President Moon has advocated for a peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. And I, I think that's very important. But I think if you look at the fundamentals right now, where we stand on the Korean Peninsula, you know, today we're talking about, we're having a conference about sustainable peace. Well, I think we need to be honest with ourselves. Right now, the peace on the peninsula is not sustainable. And I think there's one reason why. Because here in Washington, we are obsessed with denuclearization. And I, I understand why that is. I mean, the North Korean nuclear threat, I mean, as we saw in 2017, they have developed multiple different classes of intercontinental ballistic missiles that can now hit the U.S. homeland or are very close to hitting the U.S. homeland. That was a Sputnik moment for the United States. That was a shocker to the general public of this country. But I think we need to move past that now. And I think we need to find ways for the Biden administration to, to navigate on a road towards peace with the DPRK. And there's a lot of different ways that we can do this. But the fundamental way to start that process is to not abandon denuclearization. I mean, let's face it, there's no way that, that a President Biden politically is, is going to want to take the hit for, for, for making that admission, even though that, that may end up where we, where we end up. But I do think that what Biden was going to need to do, considering the fact that he's facing a massive COVID-19 crisis. In fact, I was just talking to a retired CDC official who told me just a few days ago that we could be looking at 400,000 plus cases of COVID-19 per day when Joe Biden takes the oath of office. When you're facing the, those type of you know, existential crisis in the United States, you're not going to have the political capital to do anything internationally. And that means North Korea might end up being the, you know, you know, the fourth most important thing that Biden is going to have to deal with. So I think what Biden needs to do is he needs to take a step back and he needs to take the, the goal of denuclearization and put it at the end of a full scale normalization process with the DPRK. I think that makes the most sense. I think you need to do things first and foremost, like a peace declaration ending the Korean War having liaison offices with North Korea, maybe even full diplomatic relations with North Korea. That's not a dirty word. Talking to your adversaries, if you want peace with your adversaries, is a smart thing. We did this with the Soviet Union. We do this with China. It's okay to talk to people that you, you have fundamental disagreements with. And I think that's how you move the process forward. If we have any shot at all of trying to denuclearize North Korea, to at least move to arms control, we have to be willing to talk with them. We have to be able to have peace. If not, we are going to repeat the same cycle for another decade or more when it comes to this. And do we really want to go back to 2017 where we've had these escalatory cycles where people are actually actively talking about nuclear war? I don't think so. 
Right. Um, Professor Moon, I think you might have something to say about this, as well as, you know, some here in, P here in Seoul have been arguing that the focus on deterrence rather than peace uh, is not an essential condition for preserving peace and stability um, on the Korean Peninsula, but instead it's really obstructed um, peaceful development on inter Korean relations. Do you think the Moon and Biden administrations could maybe find it difficult to harmonize President Moon's emphasis on an end of war declaration with the Biden administration's desire to shore up the credibility of an extended deterrence? In the Korean reality, self is contradictory. Uh, as Harry pointed out, uh, no South Korean relations are in conflict of relations. We need the deterrence. With that deterrence, there could be a high degree of you know, instability on the Korean Peninsula. Okay? And that is why President Moon, in fact, proposed the three ways of handling the Korean situation. First, he emphasized the importance of peacekeeping through deterrence and alliance. Second, he emphasized peacemaking through the adoption of end of war declaration and transformation of armistice agreement into some sort of peace agreement and lasting peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. Third, he emphasized peace building through peace economy. He believes that if there is an inter-Korean economic exchange and cooperation and create some sort of economic community between the North and South, that will pave the way to lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. Therefore, his policy itself could be seen as contradictory because he emphasized both deterrence and peace. And I would, I would argue that the president-elect Biden would pursue similar kinds of policy. On the one hand, he wanted to maintain peace on the Korean Peninsula through deterrence and ROK-US alliance. At the same time, he wanted to push for peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. In doing that, Adoption of end of war declarations is essential because it, it will serve as an entrance to lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. The lasting peace itself will be an exit to the problem. Therefore, I don't see any discrepancy between President-elect Biden and President Moon Jae-in. They are on the same way in dealing with the North Korean problem. Ambassador Gallucci, do you want to weigh on this? Well, it's interesting. I've, I've found uh, everybody's comments pretty easy to agree with. Um, and yet I find myself out of sympathy with um, the characterization, uh, particularly Harry's points. Uh, I, uh, Harry sounded to me very reasonable in characterizing where we've been and how we need to do something other than we've been doing over and over again. That, that makes some sense to me, having been part of those people who were um, acting in this area in the past. That said, um, I'm not uh, particularly sympathetic to the idea of putting the denuclearization objective aside. I, I, don't, I don't wanna create a straw man here. Harry can speak for himself. I'm not saying this is what he said, but I, I do wanna say that I think it is critically important to our alliance relations and to our national security, America's national security, that we not give up uh, the objective that we're, we hope to achieve, which is a denuclearized Korean peninsula. Uh, and that means that North Korea goes back to being a party uh, to the nuclear non-proliferation treaty and gives nuclear weapons. That's where I want us to end up. I don't think we were particularly wise uh, in the last few years to try to put the cart ahead of the horse though. In other words, to try to insist that the North completely denuclearize, identify all its nuclear facilities that have, were critically important to its nuclear weapons development, uh, tell us where they were so that we could inspect their uh, dismantlement. Uh, all that before sanctions relief, all that before normalization of relations. That to me st struck me as nuts. Uh, the North Koreans I knew after a couple of years of negotiating were never going to go for that, uh, and they didn't. So I, I think it is uh, reasonable 
for the U.S. to say, look, we have a, a goal of normalization too, not just you. We want the normalization of relations between DPRK and USA. Uh, we want uh, peace uh, uh, in Northeast Asia and on the, on the Korean Peninsula, and we'll take steps in that direction. And they could include the, the, the peace treaty we all talk about. They could include all kinds of things, certainly sanctions uh, relief, um, the uh, recasting of military exercises so they don't appear to be provocative, lots of things like that. And the North does similar kinds of things with respect to ballistic missile development and testing, nuclear weapons development and testing, freezing of nuclear weapons capability, some dismantlement or disarmament or arms control as Harry called it. Uh, all that is possible and, and it works for me provided we are in agreement that where we are headed here is to a situation in which Yes, the United States has normal relations with North Korea, but a North Korea that eventually gives up its nuclear weapons, accepts full scope safeguards, and uh, becomes a member of the NPT. And in that context, I think normal, normal relations is prof are profoundly in US interests, as well as those of the ROK and the DPRK. Yeah, um, Professor Moon, you want to raise a question? In a bump. Now, I have one question to you. you know. and in a sense, I agree with Harry, even though it might sound too idealistic, but uh, look at what North Korea has offered so far to the United States, okay? It demolished the Punggyeri nuclear testing site. It proposed to dismantle Dong Changni you know, missile engine test site and launching pad. It also proposed to completely and permanently dismantle nuclear facilities in, in Yongbyon. And plus, if you go back to you know, Bob Woodward in the book, Rage, and Kim Jong-un sent a personal letter to President Trump on September, I think September 6th, that he's willing to dismantle Nuclear Weapons Research Institute. And I think that's a big deal. And that would satisfy what the President-elect Biden says, drawing down of North Korean nuclear capability. If North Korea willing to come up with willing to undertake all those measures, what kinds of you know, reciprocal measures should the Biden administration take? chung sign me up. <laughs> sign me up for the deal. Um, I, 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 I am prepared to say yes I, I, you know, to, to good ideas. Um, I think you know, shutting down Yangbyon is actually a bigger deal than some people have acknowledged. Uh, that is the source of their plutonium. Uh, that's where their reprocessing is. Uh, that would be a good thing to do. The other sites are non-trivial. I think those are substantial moves in the right direction. I, d I don't want to, I mean, there, there are a couple of things I should say here. That at the end of the day, uh, the United States knows how to denuclearize. I mean, we've done this in other countries. We know what it means. And it's going to mean a lot of verification, a lot of monitoring, a lot of inspection, and all this is going to be difficult to negotiate. But you don't start there. You start just with the kinds of things that you mentioned the North is talking about. And I would snatch those up at the first opportunity, make some reciprocal steps. I'm not, I don't have to describe what they are right now, but they're in the area of sanctions relief. They could be in the area of normalization. It's lots of things. Eventually, we're going to get to needing those inspections. Eventually, you're going to get to a point where we're going to want to assure ourselves that fissile material production has stopped in North Korea, that to the extent that we can account for it, fissile material as well as nuclear weapons have been collected and removed from North Korea. Look, let's, let me say something else that is really very important for all of us to understand. Uh, and we have some experience in this. We did some extensive denuclearization in Iraq a long time ago. We know how to do it. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, North Korea will always be a threshold state. There's nothing physically that the North can do about that even if they wanted to. They know how to build these facilities. They know how to produce fissile material. They know how to build these ballistic missiles. They will always be a threshold state. Right? And that, that, I should also say, given the character of this material, let's be a little bit technical here, the amount of material used to blow up a city 
in Japan was the size of a baseball. So how many baseballs can you put under a dining room table? How many dining room tables are there in North Korea? When, uh, the degree of confidence we will have ultimately in denuclearization is very, very, should be very, very carefully understood what we're aiming for here. This is a political objective, an important political objective, and, and we shouldn't fail to try to meet that objective, but we should also be realistic about the nature of the capability we're talking about. Harry, what are your thoughts on all this? I'd like to know. Well, Jen, no, I, you know, very fascinating debate. I, I think this is great. I think these are the debates that we really need to have, whether we're Washington, Seoul, or anywhere else. Look, when it comes to the matter of denuclearization, I, I think we need to have more of these type of debates because I think the, the first and foremost, what I'm afraid the Biden administration is going to do is depending on how much bandwidth they have, whether it's COVID-19, trying to deal with the rise of China, my fear is, is that they are going to back, go back to another posture of something like strategic patience. Whereas if the North Koreans aren't willing to make the first move in terms of denuclearization in some sort of big way, the Biden administration is going to say, well, we don't have the political capital to really invest in, you know, hoping that, you know, some sort of political rapprochement is going to work out and we're just going to focus on all our other objectives. I think that's something that we really need to consider. Now, when we talk broadly about denuclearization, I think we have to stare the, the, the ghost in the face here and really start to think about what if North Korea is never going to denuclearize? Does that mean all our objectives when it comes to a sustainable peace that we're talking about today are done or over with? I think for, for a U.S. perspective, there is a, a growing movement of people. And, and you can actually start to see this. I mean, Victor Cha at CSIS, Sumi Terry at CSIS, people who are have been pretty hawkish on North Korea throughout the years have actually come out with papers recently in Foreign Affairs, Sumi Terry in, in a recent podcast, are starting to talk about arms control with North Korea. Not completely giving up on the idea of denuclearization, but you can see in the academic community, people are starting to come around to the idea that if we can't get to denuclearization, what other options do we have to deal with North Korea in some sort of way that fosters peace, that fosters security? I mean, right now, think about that some of the debates we're having in Seoul and Washington. We're all wondering if Kim Jong-un is going to test another ICBM or maybe even go a little further down the field and, and see maybe that he's going to test another nuclear weapon as a way to test the Biden administration. Do we really want to go through that escalatory spiral all over again? I mean, think about clo how close we came to nuclear war in 2017. Now, I don't think Joe Biden is, is going to start going fire and fury and making those type of comments, but do, can we keep having these type of escalatory spirals? I, I just don't think so, to be honest with you. I, I think they're getting too dangerous. So I think it's healthy to start thinking through these type of problems and what our reactions are going to be. Now, if we are looking to set conditions, whether we're talking arms control or denuclearization, we need to set that foundation. To do that, we need to do things like ending the Korean War. How are we going to ask Kim Jong-un to hand over one nuclear weapon if we're still in a state of armed conflict? That doesn't make any rational sense. So I think that's something we need to explore. President Moon has been right about that. How are we going to ask Kim Jong-un again to give up a nuclear weapon or ICBM or we're not doing things like conventional arms control? I think what we need to do when we talk about North Korea is we need to do the easier lifts first. Talking about peace, talking about arms control, then getting to the more difficult things like, you know, nuclear arms control. You know, we, we have to face reality here. This is going to be a very long-term problem. I mean, we've, we've, we've taken a crack at denuclearization, making that the prime focus for the last 30 years. It's nobody's fault. It's no administration's fault, no single person's fault. It hasn't worked out. So I think it's time to explore new approaches that create something that's more sustainable. And I, I think that's the right thing to do. There's nothing wrong with admitting that. Right. Perhaps, um, you know, Stephen Began, uh, you know, his approach that where he signaled that North Korea really doesn't have to do everything in order for the U.S. or South Korea to do something is, is perhaps the right approach. I mean, that that's a practical, realistic, perhaps honest assessment of how diplomacy with North Korea is likely to work. Um, there's going to be a lot of haggling, 
over how much the North has to do, over how much the U.S. has, or how much the South Korea has to do, but you know, we'll have to work that out. Um, I'd like to move over to the South Korea-U.S. alliance regarding uh, South Korea-U.S. military exercises and the alliances. Um, Professor Moon, there has been, of course, um, speculations that the Biden administration may want to restart the ROK U.S. military exercises. Um, you and I talked about this over our recent interview, of course. What are your expectations? Now we have a COVID-19 emergency in the U.S., in North Korea, in South Korea. I think it seems to be extremely inappropriate for us to talk about restart of military training in January through March. We will be going through the middle of acute corona in a crisis. The I think it is not you know, wise for us to have you know, joint military exercise. Also, suspending the exercise for the reason of COVID-19, that can perhaps provide very important momentum for confidence building, trust building between the Biden administration and Kim Jong-un and North and South. Maybe, paradoxically speaking, we might be able to have a corona peace. <laughs> <laughs> um, corona peace, uh, Ambassador Gallucci, what do you say to that? Um, well, I, you know, that is kind of, as they say, when you're given lemonade, when you're given lemons, make lemonade. And I, I think we could say that we'll be in a situation in which nobody's going to be wildly enthusiastic about embracing uh, robust uh, field exercises and look for ways of meeting our military objectives uh, in some way that does not put everybody at risk because of COVID-19. But I think at the, eventually you are right, I think, to raise the question. I think Jung In is absolutely right that it's not going to be the first thing on anybody's agenda to get together with, for a big military exercise. But eventually, the exercises are going to be really. I, I, will, I won't speak for the South Korean military, but I have talked to many in the US military, and they are concerned that they have capabilities that, if not exercised, will not be available if a contingency arises. So if the way they put it, if you want to really minds of the men in the USA to figure this out, but how we meet reasonable military objectiveness for interoperability and for readiness, uh, but don't present to the North um, images they find uh, provocative and threatening. I think we can do. Okay. Um, I think I, I don't think uh, we are getting smooth enough signals with Ambassador Gallucci at the moment. We're going to try linking up with Ambassador Gallucci again. Are we going to try that or? Yeah, are we okay with Ambassador Gallucci signals? Yeah, I, can you hear me all right? I can hear you. Okay, okay. We were breaking up momentarily, but yeah, we should be okay. Okay, uh, picking up, Harry, so um, what are your thoughts? I mean, sh do you think uh, the Biden administration would request the restart of the joint military exercises, and, and how do you think the Moon administration should respond to such a proposal, Harry? Well, I think, Joe, I think we gotta take a step back for a second and, and, and talk about setting up an environment where, you know, first of all, joint military exercises aren't that controversial anymore. I mean, let's be honest, militaries need to train. I mean, the North Koreans train all winter long. They have military exercises. We don't freak out about them. They're not a prelude to an invasion of Seoul. So, you know, the North Koreans constantly freaking out about this is, you know, it's silly at this point, but they use it as a, as a way to pressure us to get concessions. And look, it's worked for a long time and, and, and this is what they're going to do. But I, I think it, what the Biden administration is going to need to do is even before they take office, they need to do something to sort of set the table now. So 
Kim Jong Un does not feel that, you know, as everybody's sort of wondering right now, you know, doing something provocative to, to, to get in front of the administration, to sort of jump the line, so to speak, to, to create a problem now to, to essentially, you know, be at the top of the agenda for the administration. I, I think what Biden needs to do, but before we start talking about military tactics or anything, we've got to talk about brass tactics here. So what Biden should do is, is actually a suggestion that Joseph, you put out a few weeks ago at a conference that I attended. And, and that's to signal that what the Biden camp is going to do is, is essentially reaffirm what Donald Trump has done. And, and that is basically that we're not gonna throw out everything that Trump has done, that we're going to build on what Trump has done. And I think that would send an important signal. I mean, Biden obviously can't now because of the Logan Act start negotiating with North Korea, but he could put out a signal that he'll that he'll build on what Trump has done. He could say that he reaffirms the, the Singapore Declaration, that he reaffirms what President Moon has done. And, and I think that sends a strong signal that will essentially freeze Kim Jong-un from not being able to be you know, so provocative and maybe think that he has to do a missile test to get our attention or react to maybe what could be small joint military exercises in the spring. I mean, I, I think if we're going to have this normalized relationship with North Korea, we have to explain to the North Koreans our, our militaries need to train. And I think a, a one way to maybe solve this problem is to say to the North Koreans, look, we're going to have these exercises on such and such a day. Pick 10 people that you would like to come and view the non-classified parts of these exercises. And maybe we can come to yours too. I mean, this is something that the United States and the Soviet Union did until tensions with China have, have gotten really insane. It's something we did with Beijing and lots of different areas. So again, it's about trying to de-escalate these type of tensions so everything is not a crisis anymore. We, we need to move past that. Now, um, speaking of the uh, U.S. troops and South Korean troops, of course, uh, President-elect Biden stated that he'll seek to repair strained relations with allies and, um, and vow to drop U.S. Uh, demands for exponential increases in ally contributions to offset the cost of stationing U.S. forces in their countries, um, as well as abandoning threats to reduce or remove U.S. forces in Korea. Now, just a few days ago, we learned from the um, from that uh, we learned that the new National Defense Authorization Act will add a provision that will require the Pentagon to reconsider sending military equipment or troops to country if it uses uh, Chinese 5G technology. Now, the NDAA stands in sharp contrast to the incoming Biden administration's pledge to strengthen its security alliance. Is it not? I'll first start with uh, Master Gallucci. Um, I'm not sure exactly how you want me to respond to this. Um, I, I don't know what the Biden administration is going to do w with respect uh, to this issue. Um, I expect, generally speaking, uh, the administration will attempt to get a more moderate tone in dealing with the Chinese while not letting them off the hook. Um, either on what they do uh, uh, with uh, trade practices or other practices which we, can, we consider prejudicial. But I don't know how they're going to approach this specific issue. Um, so what is, how can we assess the Biden administration's po potential approach to China? I mean, what will the pol policy be like, would you say? Well, I, what I'm, I'm anticipating is that uh, they will try to take a step back from the rhetorical position that the Trump administration took with characterizing China as the enemy. I don't think, though, that uh, the Biden administration or broadly, even those who are critical of the Trump administration, think it was a misguided of the United States to begin to press the Chinese on in a number of areas, uh, intellectual property, trade and other areas, what it was doing uh, in uh, South China. Uh, and we're stepping out in areas that uh, fundamentally affected the security of US, US allies and friends in uh, East Asia and Northeast Asia. So I think uh, while not uh, uh, allowing the Chinese uh, too much leeway in, in these areas, I think that the rhetorical posture of the administration will be one in which we'll be looking 
uh, to engage the Chinese uh, rather than confront them and hope that we'll be able to manage areas in which we want to see a change in Chinese policy. Professor Moon, um, how might this approach to China impact Korea's assessment of, of its security and trade interests? I mean, will, it be a, will there be a change from the current situation? Now, we'll be in a very difficult position, okay, because the United States is our ally, the only ally, in a sense, and China is our strategic, you know, cooperative partner, therefore we need both. But obviously we should give more attention to the alliance, alliance rather than strategic, you know, partner. Therefore we'll be agonizing over the choice. Therefore the most desirable scenario for us is that the, the U.S. and China should avoid the, this new Cold War confrontation. And, and also I think that they can be avoided, you know. But as Bob pointed out, you know, if uh, the Biden administration changes its rhetorical tone from enemy to rival, rivalry, then I think that will somewhat lessen our burden, okay? But anyhow, uh, our government will be in full consultation with the United States. But right now, the Trump administration has unfolded the forefront. First, geopolitical containment. Second, economic decoupling, reshoring, and encirclement. And third, and the Biden administration has been pushing for the techno alliance against China, okay? including Clean Network Initiative. Fourth, the, Biden, the Trump administration has been promoting the idea of you know, value alliance against you know, China. Uh, but therefore, we should see you know, to what extent the Biden administration will be selective. Okay? If Biden administration push for all those four fronts, we'll be in a very difficult position. If Biden administration becomes more selective in choosing front lines, and as you know, Bob uh, pointed out, uh, you know, if the Biden is willing to engage with North Korea, uh, China, instead of changing Communist Party leadership in China, but trying to change its behavior, okay, then, then that will you know, open up to some space for breathe for us. Therefore, we should wait and see until the Biden administration get inaugurated in January and we'll see what kinds of policy initiative it will take. Harry, I want to address uh, the question to you now. A coalition-based strategy that raises expectations um, for alliance partners to move in tandem with the United States on policy towards China. Now, even if it preserves space for cooperation with China on you know, universal issues like climate change or non-proliferation, will nonetheless increase pressure on the Moon administration um, to align itself with the Biden administration based on you know, common values such as fellow de democracy. How do you foresee the Biden and Moon administrations dealing with issues such as, like uh, Professor Moon said, economic partnership network and the Quad Plus? Well, Jen, I think really what it comes down to is, is what you know, I think the, the fundamental question on the table that we're we sort of beating around here is what will the Biden's administration policy be on China? I mean, we could go back and look at the Obama administration's policy in China and say, you know, in a broad framework sort of sense, that might be what it is. And sort of going back to what, what Dr. Moon said is, is going back to where China is essentially a rival of the United States and not something that we're you know, trying to contain or, you know, trying to do this back-ended sort of regime change against and hoping that, you know, the Chinese Communist Party falls apart or something like that. But I, I think the other fundamental question that the United States is going to have to ask is if we are going to make China, you know, a, a, a rival in some sense, not in the, in the Trump sense of the word, but, you know, a competitive rival, what are we going to expect of our allies if, if that is going to be our strategy? And, and I think if you look at South Korea specifically, I don't think that we can expect South Korea to do some sort of, you know, formal alliance with us against China or some sort of economic decoupling or or sort of broadly align with us against Beijing. I mean, that's impossible. I mean, if that were to happen, I mean, 
you know, South Korea would be facing an economic depression if, if we started trying to push them towards decoupling. It's not going to happen anyway. So I think the United States needs to take a very strategic approach when it comes to Beijing. There are certain fundamental, shall I use the word, red lines that, that I think that we need to send as a signal to Beijing that we're not going to tolerate. I mean, for example, I think we all know them and they stretch from, you know, Bush two years until the present. We don't want to see China dominate and control the South China Sea and turn it to their own personal lake. I think that's a very fair and reasonable request. I think, for example, we don't want to see them turn Taiwan in, 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 into a quasi-province and, and re-merge by force back into Beijing. I think that's a very reasonable thing. I don't think we want to see China dominate the East China Sea by, by force. So I, I think those are very broad things that I think we can expect. but we're going to have to think very carefully about what we ask of our allies when it comes to that. I mean, are, are we going to start asking allies to, you know, are we going to tell Germany that, you know, they can't deal with, with Beijing when it comes to 5G or, or South Korea? No. I, I mean, and I'm going to take this point just even a little bit more broadly. I even think here in the United States, it's still an open question of where we're trying to figure out what our relationship with China is going to be. I mean, a very simple example. The United States Chinese bilateral trade relationship is worth hundreds of billions of dollars, I think $650 billion. I mean, the American people are voting for it with their pocketbook that they're not completely convinced that China is a rival. So I think we have to take this question much more, much more broadly. I mean, China is not the Soviet Union, it's a very different type of rivalry. And I, I think still here in the United States, we're trying to figure out what that means. It's very complicated. So I, I don't. I think that makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways. Let's now move on to um, another area that's uh, pretty difficult, I'm sure, for the Biden administration as well as the Moon administration to deal with the trilateral coordination among South Korea, United States, and Japan um, as a foundation for dealing with North Korea and other threats uh, to the liberal international order. Now, Biden's pick for Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, um, he, he played a major role in establishing a regular trilateral coordination dialogue during the Obama administration, and I'm sure will undoubtedly seek to restore these meetings under the Biden uh, administration as well. Ambassador Gallucci, how do you foresee the Biden administration making this move? Um, I, I think your lead-in is correct. I think that the orientation of the administration uh, is pretty clear now that uh, Tony is at the, it's going to be going to be the Secretary of State, uh, and it would have been deducible for the Biden administration in any case to try to uh, once again regenerate uh, better relations between Seoul and Tokyo. I mean, you you, you are exquisitely sensitive to the problems the United States creates uh, for Seoul in its dealings with North Korea on the one hand and its dealings with Beijing on the other hand. Well, at the same time, I'd like to suggest to, to, to you in Seoul that it is um, uh, rather obvious to us that the credibility, strength, effectiveness of our alliances uh, are fundamentally uh, impacted by the character of relations between uh, the ROK and Japan. And we will want to do everything we can, let me use that word, to encourage uh, Seoul and Tokyo uh, to reconcile uh, and to cooperate and to make our alliance relations uh, all the more effective. Now, how exactly the Biden administration is gonna do that, I don't know. Uh, but I'm, I'm fairly certain that is going to be um, high on their list of political objectives within Northeast Asia. That was um, diplomat Ambassador Gallucci talking, was it not? <laughs> 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 Professor Moon, uh, with the Biden administration seeking to restore trilateral security cooperation, how willing is Seoul to work with uh, Washington and Tokyo? And more importantly, how likely is it that this uh, relationship will be restored? It's up to Japan. Now you go back to 1999. <laughs> you know what happened? Dr. Perry, William Perry, 
strong emphasize trilateral coordination. And we had a trilateral coordination group, US, Japan, and South Korea. At that time, Prime Minister Obuchi strongly supported President Kim Dae-jung's engagement policy with North Korea. There was a full understanding between Japan and South Korea. History was not the big issue at the time. At the time, Prime Minister Obuchi really made a heartfelt apology to the past historical mistakes. Therefore, Japan-South Korea relations was very good. U.S.-Japan relations were very good. ROK-U.S. relations were very good. Trilateral relations very good. But now what is happening? Japanese position, no talk with North Korea unless North Korea completely dismantled nuclear weapons. Okay, President Moon Jae-in has been appealing to Prime Minister Abe, even Prime Minister Suga. Look, history issue cannot be resolved only through the talks between two leaders. It is directly linked to people's mind. We, should, we need time to heal people's minds coming out of this historical past. Let us cooperate on the issues of strategic issues, such as North Korean nuclear issue, rise of China. But uh, very, I'm very sorry to say this, but the Japanese leadership was not interested in that ideas. Okay? They're simply saying, okay, we got to resolve the kidnap Japanese issue first. And we should pursue maximum pressure on North Korea. And you got to resolve in you know, a forced labor in you know, a workers issue and the comfort women issue first. Then we can have a meaningful talks. I, I just think it is not, I don't think, I cannot really agree with this kind of approach. In order to have very robust trilateral cooperation, there are gonna have chain changes on the part of Japanese government too. Look, cooperation is mutual, reciprocal, not one-sided. Then we can revive 1999 Paris process trilateral coordination group. I hope the Biden administration would get some lessons from 1999 and revive old form of trilateral cooperation and coordination. Harry, any thoughts? Um, you know, I guess I would just say broadly, I, just to take a quick historical perspective, going back to, you know, I know we're still in the Trump administration, but I, thinking through about how the Trump administration basically didn't want to touch Japanese South Korean relations. Um, I think that was a missed opportunity. You know, when, when, when things last summer were, were sort of blowing up, the Trump administration basically punted on the issue. And, and I think that was a real mistake. Um, you know, to have one of our, our two top allies, you know, essentially not talking to one another, you know, having, you know, th these type of problems. I mean, obviously, you know, President Trump or, or you know, Secretary Pompeo are gonna be able to solve the issue, but could act as a facilitator. We like that word in Seoul, right? Um, you know, to, to sort of help these issues through because it, it doesn't help anybody when these historical tensions keep, you know, keep getting brought up. I mean, they're obviously deeply felt in Tokyo and Seoul. And that's what an ally like the United States can do to try to bring the parties together to try and ensure that that trilateral cooperation is there. So, you know, I, I think in that, perspective, I think that was a lost opportunity. And I hope that's something the Biden administration will learn on. And if, you know, these situations do pop up again, which I'm, I'm sure they will, the, the Biden administration can be that facilitator. And I think that can work. Now, um, we have about six minutes left. So I want to ask um, one question to each of you. Um, uh, first, beginning with Professor Moon, what in your view is the, um, uh, the, the, at uh, most, um, most important issue that the Biden administration and the Moon administration should together work on to try to, to, try to get solved um, as, they, as they coordinate their efforts in working together, the most important issue that needs to get addressed first and foremost. Well, I think the most important and immediate issue is a defense cost sharing issue. And I, I, I really don't see any problem uh, between President Moon Jae-in and uh, President-elect Biden. That issue can be resolved because our government is willing to you know, cover up certain amount of you know, defense cost. Therefore, if it is not you know, really an you know, extraordinary demand on the part of the United States, uh, 
President Moon Jae-in will be able to persuade the South Korean people and the National Assembly. Therefore, they can be as handled. Transfer of wartime operational control, it may encounter a lot of problems because there are a lot of so-called, you know, you know, the barriers to resolve that issue. Okay. Uh, there can be some, you know, uh, you know, the transfer of wartime operation control could be somewhat you know, controversial, even you know, uh, during the Biden administration. And, but overall strengthening of ROK alliance, we don't see any you know, big problem, okay? And also there are some words, you know, as Harry pointed out, you know, if, you know, and also you know, Kan Young also raised that issue too. You know, if we do not cover defense cost sharing, you know, U.S. may reduce or withdraw American, withdraw American forces from South Korea. But if you look at the 2021 Defense Authorization Act, uh, it is very unlikely. You know, the U.S. Congress will be very tough on that issue. Therefore, I don't see any big problem. Therefore, I, I, I really don't see any big problem in strengthening ROK U.S. alliance. But again, issue is the North Korean nuclear issue, okay? And we are hoping that we have a much more close consultation with Biden administration so that we can have a chance to talk with North Korea. But as and Harry and Bob both you pointed out, you know, President Trump will be wrestling with the issue of a pandemic, economy, climate change, Iranian deal, Chinese you know, rise. Maybe you know, North Korean nuclear issue may be set aside a bit, but uh, that President being the Biden, case, that Biden, being the case. Mm, mm. I just want to correct President Biden, not Trump. You just said Trump. Yeah. Right. President Biden. No, no, it would be Biden can, yeah, Biden uh, can the lower the priority on North Korea nuclear issue. If that being the case, why can the uh, president of elect Biden outsource it to South Korean government <laughs> so that we can take a more leading role and find our solutions and have a very close consultation with the policy review team of the Biden transition, you know, in a, in a team, you know, that I would, you know, one of that kinds of things. And as to the finally, I wanted to make a comment on the U.S.-China relations. Uh, I know that uh, President-elect Biden is much more civilized, well-mannered, and wise in dealing with China. Therefore, I want that U.S., United States, and the Biden administration would come up with more, much uh, wise strategies with a civilized manner in dealing with China. Don't try to change the Communist Party system in China. That will lead to the disastrous outcome. But if the United States does not touch that kind of core you know, interest of China, I think China is willing to change its own, its own behavior. And therefore, for us, the best thing is to avoid U.S.-China collision course. <laughs> um, we have about 30 seconds for each of you. Final thoughts first, Ambassador Gallucci, please. Yeah, well, I, what I would say is that it, it is natural that we all would focus on on uh, U.S. DPRK and the role of the ROK in resolving the issues between us. But from the American perspective, taking a step back, the key issue that we start with is how to deal with China. And you accused me of committing diplomacy before, and I plead guilty. I, I think this is a difficult case. Harry came as close to nailing it as I think one could, um, but it's a very tough one. And I don't see the Chinese uh, even if we are uh, skilled, as I expect the Biden administration to be skilled, uh, there are going to be just some things which are not going to be easy to manage. And Harry mentioned a number of them, exactly what the Chinese do on the East, East China Sea and the South China Sea, what exactly the, the, they do on Taiwan. Uh, these, these questions are ones that ultimately can confront vital interests of the United States and our own definition of our strategic position in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, and this, I think, is the challenge of the times. Harry, please. May Harry. I have the last word, Chen? Yeah, Harry, final thoughts. 
Sure, sure, I'll be very quick. I mean, I'm just gonna end it on a USDPRK note. It's very clear that this panel, I think, shows is that the United States is going to have a very full plate in 2021. We, the United States may not even get to any Korea-centric issues for the first six to nine months. I mean, we're gonna be dealing with COVID-19 and economic recovery, rise of China. I think those are the top three. So that makes Korea in the fourth position. So with that being said, I think the United States and South Korea need to think about changing their goals. And again, I don't want to jump back to denuclearization, but I'm just going to touch on it very briefly. If, if we're not able to, to dedicate the political bandwidth to that goal, then I think it's okay to change that goal. There's nothing wrong with that. And I, I think there's a lot of opportunities for peace building. And I, and I think there's a lot of things that we can do here as long as we're willing to adjust those goals and our expectations. I think if we do that, 2021 could be a good, Korean, a good year on the Korean Peninsula. All right, well, that brings us to the end of uh, our roundtable on sustainable peace on the Korean Peninsula, 2020 U.S. presidential elections and its impact on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, thank you, Professor Moon Jung-in, Harry Kazanis, and of course, Ambassador Robert Gallucci for a wonderful discussion and all of you here on the uh, panel session and all of you watching from home. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, this is where we wrap up our special live coverage of the 2020 International Symposium on Sustainable Peace on the Korean Peninsula. The sessions do continue throughout the day on Thursday, which you can watch live on www.ispk.co.kr. But for now, we say goodbye. Thank you for watching.